and welcome back to the book and life podcast today i am super excited because we're going to have a really good author on that exemplifies i would say commercial fiction and really fiction that makes us think about things and think about life but before we go on to that i just uh, want to quickly read from the adverts portion of our podcast and it's for Marianne Marianne Curley's The Shadow and it's the Time Guardian book 4 series the battle is over the war is won the prophecy complete but life can't just pick up where it left off for Ethan struggling to cope with tragic loss at odds with with friends in the guard he finds himself adrift jumping at shadows and sensing someone who can't possibly be there Blaming herself for goddess Athena's death to sell Spears revenge and vilify the immortal's plan for world domination that Giselle hadn't planned on love. And that leaves her with an unbearable choice should she follow her heart or the strings of her goddess short on praise but high on expectation who continues to pull her from the grave. As the guard and the order, order battle through the past and into an impossible future, darkness lurks around every corner. The fight for the world's survival rests with just one. Is it friend or foe who stands in the shadows? And just to note that The Price of Freedom by Rosemary Rowan, which is um, from her Roman British crime series, is having a portion of its donations donated to the Ukraine crisis, and her agent has donated her commission. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our guest for today. And now, guys, I get to introduce to you somebody I completely admire, I think is absolutely amazing. Please, everybody, welcome Louise Allen. Hello. (laughs) So, Louise, I'm fascinated by your books. Um, I think they're so heartwarming and heart touching because they raise issues but you've got such an incredible story there that it just blows my mind because it's a totally different genre and style of writing so could you tell us a little bit about sky story because that's your current release as we talk in the 12th of july this is being recorded so uh could you tell us a little bit about sky story and then uh, where you got the inspiration to write oh, it. Oh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, yes, I write uh, a series of books called Thrown Away Children, and Sky Story is somewhere, I think she's number one, two, three, five in there. I've got a few more coming out. Um, all, the, all my books are based on our experiences of fostering and looking after children. Um, we became a fostering family about 10 years ago and have fostered a lot of children short term and we've kind of kept a few who are now <laughs> permanent. Um, and I have birth children and I have stepchildren, so I have the full raft. Um, Sky's story uh, was a horrendous story. It took me a long time to actually write that one. That one happened on much earlier on in our fostering career. And it's about... Um, two children that come into care who have a, a, a mother and a father who uh, the father was uh, if you like uh, an academic who was retired um, and the mother was one of his students now why it was so difficult to write for me was that I used to teach in academia I, I used to work in the university for years and these people if you like were my people <laughs> I knew, I knew not, not them in particular, but um, I, I spent a lot of time around what I considered to be academic and clever people. So to hear what happened to Skye and her sister was actually a very difficult time for us. And it completely made me reorientate what I thought about everything. Um, Skye and her sister um, experienced... Uh, horrendous abuse now it's not every when you say abuse or neglect everyone thinks oh you've been starved and you've been sexually abused or beaten abuse and neglect can take the form in many 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 things and with this particular uh, set of children the abuse came through the mother and father's emotional neglect and preoccupation with um, their political group which is called Stonegram 
and they were um, obsessed. They became obsessed with hacking and trying to bring down the system. Their father had previously been an academic. He came out of America, and through his own kind of behavior and his pre uh, his kind of um, shall we say taste of young female students had a series of young female students who were year one students who ended up this one being pregnant another one got pregnant and her parents took her back to europe um so it, it, it it's, it's it's sadness all around and it's exploitation all around but people uh, when they exploit, tend to call it something else or justify it to themselves differently. But the upshot was that the, the home in which they lived in, which was a housing association home, they they lived in there as hoarders, and the children were actually s scooping bits of uh, stuff from the hall and the and the the stairs to sit on and to sleep on. They couldn't even sleep in the bath anymore because it was so full of takeaway containers and books and manuscripts and all sorts of things. And it came to the stage where the, the father, um, who was a lot older than the mother, just sat in a wheelchair day in, day out, didn't move. And the stench was horrendous. And it was a horrible, horrible life for them. But of course, you don't know this when you <laughs> when you respond to a referral that comes through your uh, email or you get a text going, oh, we've got a referral for you, Louise, have a look. And, and, and this is um, how fostering adoption goes. You tend not to really know quite who you're letting in your house because you're not just letting children in your house, you're actually bringing with them their family, their friends, sometimes their predators, mostly through technology. And with this particular story, it's about how an iPhone 7 Brought, nearly brought our entire family down because the birth mother was communicating with the oldest child constantly. They were filming us, we, they had surveillance on us, we were being set up to be filmed so that the police would come around. It was an active revenge um, on us by the, the, the birth mother. The father actually died in the midst of all this. Um, oh. Yeah, it was just awful. So we had, then we had a children, but the children didn't react to that which is really interesting so you you when you foster children and you, you really do see humanity in a different way and you, you see mm -hmm. people in a different way and, and you're not only dealing with the children their family you're dealing with the state with state care with, with with social workers with their managers and as uh foster carers you start this work with absolute love in your heart and kindness you respond to a need which is sent out, which is literally broadcasted. We need more foster carers. We need, these children need homes. But what they don't tell you is the world yeah. you're just about to step into. So that's the theme yeah, for all exactly. my books. <laughs> but it, it... But that's a really good thing because you, you're, in a sense, preparing people for what they have to deal with. And But on the other hand, you're saying, hey, you're going to get something really valuable back. You're going to just see a child heal and you're going to see them get better. Um, there is like a, an almost a hope at the end of that because even during my time working with children, I saw just a huge change in the children and I saw them mm. get happier mm. and change and, and, and become normal ki children and, and not children that were looking for a fight or looking for way out or anything Absolutely. like that. So. And yeah, there. Even though there is this outcry for you know, because we had at the church, we had people coming to the church mm. all the time saying, "Please, please, please, come take these children." Um, and for me, being such a child-driven person, I was destroyed. Mm -hmm. I just wanted. I literally was like, I just need to take mm -hmm. these children. Out. But my husband was saying no because like his mom had been involved in it and things like that. And he said, "No, no, no, no." He says, "We're not ready. Mm -hmm. We're not prepared for something mm -hmm. like this." And and I'm very grateful that he did mm. say that because after I went and I, I did my own mm. job, I was like, okay, yeah, I wouldn't have mm. been ready for this, mm. you know. But you have your heartstrings pulled because, you know, they're crying out to you and they're saying, oh, these children need help, these mm. children need help, these children need help. Um, and, and they just don't tell you the, the other side of it, which is, you know, as you've explained, and I think that's that's incredible. You were saying that you've got two books coming mm. out. Uh, what are those ones ah, about? You know, all my books are cheerful. 
Um, but most of them do, thankfully, have happier endings. The next one out is Billy's yeah. story, which is, uh, uh, a, well, the breaking up and the falling out of a paedophile ring, which, again, is a subject oh. that people aren't very comfortable with. Um, now, I, you know, I have to be honest here, and that is I do live on another planet when it comes to children, is that my my understanding of children and their, and their and what happens to them is huge because my own birth father was a paedophile. That's why I'm here. So I don't have the fear, the sickness, the prejudice, or anything about paedophile children that are involved with paedophile rings. But a lot of people do, yeah, no, and because course. a lot of people can't hear it, can't deal with it, that's partly why they're allowed to. They they not allowed, but why they carry on because socially it's a very difficult subject. But the, um, the, that one's about um, how uh, a community became buried within another community. And sometimes communities become lawless. And if they've been there a very long time and they're very clever, they can become lawless. And they also infiltrate into the very system that's meant to be protecting the children. So i.e. the police, children, social care and so on. And this is a story about how from within the organization, mandates and acceptances and permissions was, were being given and also vitally and i think this is increasingly um <laughs> relevant as we as we fight against the closure of freedom of information requests is a lot of information was hidden or lost um mm -hmm. but the children how we how we ended up knowing uh, well what happened to uh foster carers i i've got a few whatsapp groups going this is when technology becomes good so as much as technology is yeah. uh, <laughs> really um, influencing how we look after these children, it can actually work for our benefit as well. Um, social workers on the whole yeah. don't like foster carers to talk to each other. That's part of their, their, their insecurity and their, their need to control. Uh, so it's sort of, you know, divide and rule. But, you know, again, because of technology, we've all got our WhatsApp group. And the WhatsApp group, yeah, we all go, oh, what's going on? How are you doing? So we've all got each other's back. So we all protect each other. Yeah, that's and good. we um, this particular one day, this the, my, this particular group, the phone was pinging like crazy, and I think, what the hell is going on here? And then they were going, oh, we got a referral, we got a referral, and I think it's this family, this family, this, this sort of mystical family that we've all heard about but no one knows about, and of course, foster carers. You don't know who foster carers are. Some, most of them are absolutely extraordinarily wonderful people. And a lot of them are the wives or the, or the partners or the brothers or sisters of policemen, police women, um, lawyers, whatever. We've all got our own network. So we, we found out who this, all the, there was about 20 children coming into care all at once, all different ages. And then the story unravels yeah. about how again through technology how these children were being controlled via their soft toys in our care it, it, it it's a true story it, it's insane and this stuff happens more than you would ever imagine Did I no I, I i could actually imagine <laughs> i think with my own experiences yeah i um, i remember actually checking stuffed toys for cameras That's and all sorts yeah That's so uh, and actually a lot of uh, people have them in their homes as nannies, don't they? They they stick things in the corner of rooms. Nanny nanny cams, cams. yeah. So it's yeah. not that un, you know unbelievable at all, and it and, and it's terrifying again when it happens to you. So not only I've had a few quite a few incidents through children's gaming systems and phones and other things that we have been surveyed that the children are kept in contact. We're being controlled, so. No one really likes to talk about that, but that is a whole area you need to think about if you're going to foster. And the system doesn't know how to deal with it either. You know, what does it do? Um, and then after that, I've got my uh, first book about twins. Um, we looked after two twins called Max and Mia. Now, this is an important story because people assume that children coming into care are from poverty, poverty of mind or poverty of purse not the case at all yeah there is a lot of abuse and neglect going on in the, the upper echelons of our society but it's better hidden and this is the fallout of a community of a couple within the community that you know were, were very wealthy were very cool very happening but their world fell apart and that was because of um problems around postnatal depression that got let undealt with that were left dangling and then domestic abuse and so on 
So I, I never actually am short with stories. <laughs> Keep. No, it sounds like no. you're not. Okay. You're a bit like me. You're constantly writing something and doing something, which is fantastic. And I think it's, I think I, it's absolutely amazing. I have one of your books sitting in my room, which I have not <laughs> read yet. Um, and it, it was weird. I don't know. Somebody gave it to me and said, hey, are you like different stories? Try this. And, that. and of course, I, I haven't read it yet because my pile is like. I got one of those. <laughs> leaning over my my bed. Um, uh, you know, my husband makes a joke of, Crystal, if there's any more books on that tower, we're going to we're gonna get cracked in the middle <laughs> of the night here. Um, so, yeah, no, it, it's fantastic to meet somebody else who's prolific, who has that passion for it who's writing every day you know it's weird because I, I love meeting other writers who are mums because you know I'm trying to be a mum and I've, I've got this nervousness about can I how am I gonna balance writing and being a mom like <laughs> this is gonna you be do. weird but I'm excited about it because I have the most amazing partner who kids just mm -hmm. love him like the second they see him like even stranger kids who've never seen him in before in their life, they look at him and their eyes get big and they get this huge smile on their face and they're like, oh, because he looks like a climbing <laughs> frame to them. So then he has all these random kids who'll start trying to play with him and crawl over him and, and yeah, so he's amazing with kids. I don't know what he's like with infants yet, but um, he's amazing with kids and I can't wait to see sort of all that and he's going just on. broken down you in in just a, a couple of seconds have just helped me you're helping me break down all these ridiculous ideas about who are the carers who who are the mothers what are fathers you know it's people who like children and care about children but more importantly children are the best judge of all children are the best exactly judge of yeah all about all of us now when i meet the, the amount of times that I've seen toddlers, like not even toddlers, infants just looking at him with these sort of whole big expressions, <laughs> just their big eyes and the <gasps> mouths open mm -hmm. and, the, you know, their hands come up and they start trying to grab him. And <laughs> these are just strange kids he's wanting, but it's not, you know, relations or anything. And they just adore yeah. him and well, love him. And he's just like... Very sick making faces and yeah he instantly reacts back to them which is i think is amazing yeah. um but i've never seen children kind of be able to go by him and not just be like oh, you know and and he's helped raised his his cousins and his niece and stuff and the second they see him they just go mad it's all about him oh. we could we could vanish <laughs> all the rest of us adults could disappear because as far as they're concerned, they've got Ian, Ian's the world, that's it. Like, the rest of us just don't mm -hmm. exist. Um, you know, and it, I think it's fantastic. It really is, because I get to go have a cup of tea and talk to the parents. And, you know what I mean? Like, have that whole, give them adult conversation for, you know, however long we're there. Um, and I think they appreciate it because, you know, everyone gets a little sick and tired of watching Teletubbies and Absolutely. Pepper, Pepper Pig, you know. Um, I I cannot listen to the Teletubby theme song <laughs> ever again. I grew up in Children's Hospital and that was six o'clock in the morning. All you would hear is, Teletubbies, Tele And I was like, oh my God. And I, I literally opened my eyes and said, who's got the remote? I know. Because <laughs> I couldn't stand it. I hated it but yeah that that, that was growing up in children's <laughs> ward um you never get over no. it oh dear me so what uh what would you say is the the book that you're gonna have coming out round about sort of the 12th of january because this is well, when that, uh, the 16th well, of january when it's about two. to be released that that i've got one coming out in november and i got i think I've got another one coming out january february but I've, I've also got another oh, cool. one coming out. I've gone into a whole new area because before writing, before anything, I'm an artist. That's what got me through my own childhood. I went to art school. I'm a yeah. painter and illustrator, but I've actually never wow. been comfortable in the art world, um, selling my own art. It's that I'm a, you know, no, I'm it's, it's a bit of a not, weird place. It's a very weird, yeah. weird place. And, and, and as an ex abused child, I would I would make parallels with the art world. But I I can't blame you because there is. I mean, I've I've met a lot of artists in my time, and 
mm, they, they walk a very thin line, oh, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. You know, and I, I don't know many that aren't addicted to drugs yeah. or haven't got huge issues yeah. or huge scars yeah. and huge trauma. Yeah, so I, I don't blame you for that. I really don't. It's a very uncomfortable world. And, I, and, you know, now at this stage in my life, I mean, I paint and draw nearly every day as I write as well. And I've never found my place yeah. in the art world. But uh, uh, two years ago, and I think it was in lockdown, um, I got I got fed up yeah. with... Um, I got Yeah, I got fed up with... Uh, mental health being described to children I, I have a number of children that have misdiagnosed themselves because of the amount of yep you know what i can only describe as pub quizzes available online to children who suddenly come downstairs and say i've got adhd i've got this i've got that i've got depression i've got social anxiety and they went whoa 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. hang on a minute you haven't been you know you haven't been out for a few days so you've lost your touch you know and they've kind of there's this whole way of yep. talking uh, where people have given themselves so many labels and I find it deeply confusing for children so with that in mind and my just sheer frustration as somebody who has lived through hell and back and 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 you know, I'm here I'm yeah. laughing it's fine and it, we, we're in this kind of world where we are, you know we're meant to be happy we're told to be happy our ambition is to be happy but the pursuit of happiness is actually living so the idea of being happy yes. all the time is a bit of a burden, particularly for children if they don't understand that uh, you have bad days, yeah. dark days, you have rubbish days, you know, people let you down, you let people down. We're all doing it. We're, it's called being human. So I wanted to find a way of conveying this to children. Anyway, I spent quietly... 16, 17 months a month looking after children and, and writing my books and doing all the other stuff I do. I got up really early every yep. morning and went to bed really early in the morning most evenings. I did 32 illustrations and I wrote a text. And I'm just going through. I've had an offer for this, which is really good. Wow. It's a fully illustrated children's book called Ask a Seahorse About the Nine Colors of Happiness. Because I love seahorses. Oh, cool. And children love seahorses. So that could be coming out. I'm waiting for that one yeah. now. But it's for me, it's a whole new area. And it's a way. And I, even though I write, and and I, I write as an adult yeah. after a whole life of childhood of undiagnosed dyslexia. And then just generally everyone who's stupid. Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to say yeah. to anyone out there is that those who knock the way we spell right form sentences are awful they're little dictators and i find that the most nastiness yep. comes with people who correct your spelling and can make make flippant comments because we didn't all get to go to good schools we didn't all go to school like me i missed most of it nope. so i want to say to any well done so you did I. we have the stories we can do the technical stuff later it's having the stories, it's having the, the mm -hmm. determination and, and the, 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 the magic within you to convey those stories. We are storytellers. We don't fit within that you know, thing. Exactly. And, I, and I, for many years, I was you know, told I was stupid and believed I was stupid. And then the beast was unleashed. And I, you know, I've Same. got seven or eight books behind me now, more coming. And don't let any snocky person yeah. put you off writing because they, 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 they judge, you know, where you put your comma or your, your brackets or your... <laughs> it, it's, for, it's very funny you say that because I've been through the situations where I've been rejected uh, because of my dyslexia. Um, I actually recently went through um, a situation where a publisher oh. said we are not going to contract you because you have dyslexia and we don't have the time to work with you to get your stuff up to yeah. our standards. Um, and I, I was, I will admit, I was heartbroken and I was hurt and I, I was angry and I went and I got a dyslexia test and waiting yeah. for the results at the moment. And... But I felt yeah. stupid. And then the woman said to me, she says, Crystal, for goodness sake, you you know, you grew up in a children's hospital and you had to work off worksheets, yeah, yeah. but there was no teacher to teach you, she said. And you had a mother who had 
at her own struggles and her own issues. She said, goodness sake, you, you've done yeah. more than anyone could ever imagine. Because the Why are you being so hard on yourself? And that's the thing. I am so hard on myself because I think almost that perfectionist attitude gets put into people like us who maybe don't have the perfect education or the perfect, you know, education system. And, and I hate that. And I absolutely just, I want to wring teachers' necks when they say that. Um, in fact, I got dragged into the principal's office for saying to a child, child, let's, you know, let's be good today. Let's yeah. try not to be bad today. Because that was how a child understood the, you know, the difference between being good and being bad. And I got dragged in the office for using that word. So mm -hmm. I've been there. I've witnessed the people struggling. I've witnessed people struggling. And I think it's amazing that you're, but, you're changing yeah. it. You're changing that kind of conversation. You're changing you that topic. So you don't, um, yeah, to me, yeah, it's you're got to be done. Um, amazing. You know, how many good writers, how many good storytellers, yeah. how many good artists, how many good just don't fit into that very narrow frame which they have created for themselves. How, you know, neurodivergence, which is basically dyslexia, yeah. is a, uh, dis yes. a disability. They could say to an author, we're not going to yep. publish you because you've got no legs. We're not going to publish you because, you know, we don't like the, the look of you. We don't like... But they will... They, I've had manuscripts sent back with red pen marks, like some frantic teacher was all over it, like, I thought, well, you have the time to correct me and, mm -hmm. and tell me you can't do it. Why didn't you... But, but you give me no feedback about the actual story. I know I could tell stories. I know I could tell stories because I live yeah. them. We all live our lives, don't we? They're everywhere. And I think... Yeah. Is a our stories are our lives, It's yeah. like with the arts is... The arts need to be released. We, we as artists and creatives, and whatever our endeavours, need to crack it and bust it open because it is elitist. The funding is elitist. Yep. The, um, the, 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 the kind of descriptions of what we do, the frames of what we do are elitist. The, the art world, yep. when I was uh, an art student, and it was that whole kind of, you know, Tracy Emin and all that lot, Damien Hurst, my peer group. I could relate to it because I had been abused. Yeah. There was a um, piece of work and it was about, you know, I'm going to swear now, forgive me. And I can't, is it the, I can't remember which brothers because there are lots of brothers in the art world. Um, and it, there's a piece called Fuckface. Yeah. And there was a child with a penis in its mouth. Now, they thought, oh, wow, well, how out there, how edgy, but they had no idea what that meant, what permission they, what permission they get. No, I mean, that's you know, totally and I think the art world inappropriate. Has, um, yeah. a responsibility, and I, and I find that the art world was a very privileged world. It depended on what school you went to, your connections, all that kind of stuff. And I backed away, and I backed away because yeah. I didn't have the confidence. I had no social capital. I ran away at 15 to save my life from the abusive home I was in. No qualifications. Yeah. I, was, I was put in remedial classes because I couldn't spell. I was told I was stupid. Oh, but something in yeah. me something in me kept going and I'm so glad I did and if anyone is having a bad day when they're listening to this keep going keep going you will get no nope. yeah it's a don't don't give up just because it's today's bad you never know mm -hmm. how it's going to play out or you know how things are going to change and I always say that to people too because I meet so many people that get desperate and get tired and just say oh, I want to give up and and I say well the Why are you going to give up? Because you don't know it's what's the challenges. The you don't know what's going to get better. my book for children, like, uh, The Nine Colors of Happiness, there's black in there and grey yeah. in there and red in there because everything, happiness or success, if it is given too quickly, it will be dropped. Mm -hmm. People don't appreciate it. If you work for it, and most people I have learned don't get success immediately unless they have a whole greedy kind of marketing and where there are lots of people trying to get something out of them too so that could be a fake success if 
you want real success yeah. and you have to really think about what you mean by success if you want money i think that's quite an important question to ask yourself if you're a creative is what success and success now i'm in my 50s yeah. is getting up each day and knowing i've got a studio to go to to work in i've got a few book deals but it took me until mm -hmm. i was 50 to get a book deal now this is realistic you know we didn't yeah. all go and study english at, the, at oxford mm -hmm. and cambridge some of us were cleaning toilets you know some of us have yeah, had other journeys but it's it's our journey isn't it your journey is your journey and yeah. it's as important as my journey and those that the, the the work often the work we are the choice of work we are told to look at and to read isn't always representative of the talent mm -hmm. out there I think. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I, I, I keep saying that to people. I'm like, don't let what other people think or deter even more, you from being who you are. Don't worry about people you don't know or have. Or, or you know, destroying your yeah. dream. Whatever they think or not think, doesn't, it's no yeah. relevance. No relevance you know? at all. What you need to do is stay focused on what's good. No, it's not. Yeah, and, and I keep saying that to people. I'm like, for goodness sake, you know. It, it's about... It's about you. It's about your journey. It's about your stories. It's about what's important to you. Live that. Don't no. live what other people think or say. So, we're going into the book portion of this podcast. Uh... What is the book that you've read recently that Ooh, stuck with you Oh, let's think about most? that. I, mean, I can tell you about what I'm reading. There are three three books, I think. They, and that when um, I thought about it, they all have a common theme. Now, bearing in mind, when I was uh, a child, I didn't like reading. But I read one book from start to finish, which was really yeah. unusual for me. And I sat down and read it in two or three days. And no one knew I read it. And that was Walkabout. <laughs> yeah, by James Vance yeah. Marshall. And that oh, okay. was about struggle, about race, because I have a lot of issues about race, because I look white, mm -hmm. but I'm actually Moroccan <laughs> and Jewish. Yeah, we all do. It is a big you know, problem. What is yeah, that? no, why, I, why I agree with you on that. Me? There's no box I can fill in that actually, you know, has me in it. And then I think I'm reading at the moment, uh, The Little Brothers. I don't know whether you've come across Little Brothers. That, uh, it's, I've heard of them. I just haven't gone reading, to them. I mean, honestly, if you could see my 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 reading, reading list, you would feel sorry that's for me. Colton Whitehead. Now, again, that again is a theme. That's about the the the, the, the account of a reform school in America, in Florida, and the abuse that went on there. Yeah. Um, and the book that I think, oh my word, you know, and there and was a lot that went on there. On yeah. Now, but it's hidden. It's always been hidden. Yeah, it, it is really hidden. And I mean, I look at, you know, I sometimes when I'm feeling down, I go and I look at the kids that are, you know, up for adoption in America. Mm. They have many kids where it's four or six they're trying to hold at one time. But, you know, you've got to look to make sure that there's not those ties that say you have to stay in a certain state. They have to stay in the certain town because they need access to their birth parents. So, you know, I, I look there because it, it's a reminder to me that one day, you know, I can adopt when I'm older, a little bit more older mm. than I am. And I've got family of my own. And, you know, I can I can make a difference at, at a later date um, that, you know, could change somebody's life and who could maybe even save somebody's life. So, uh, yeah, I, I do look there to kind of, I don't want to say cheer me up, but it, it gives me a reminder of why I'm writing so much and why mm. I'm fighting so much. Mm. To no, that's really do the important. That I'm that's doing, really so. good. And I think you know, my um, when I was young, like yeah. trying to always say I didn't want children because of my own experience, so I didn't reveal my own experience to anyone at all. I carried that quietly for forty odd years. Um, but the, which, you know, when we can all go and hold it again, I would have my own suitcase just for my books. So authors like <laughs> Louisa Neal, Deirdre Madden, and Sally Rooney. Um, I'd love to get stuck yep. into their books. I like their voices. Um, I don't know whether it's because I am a female. 
Um, but I've always preferred female singers, and I've always ended up look, reading female writers because um, they speak to me. I understand them much better. It was Jeanette Winterson, actually, that, that you know got me launched into doing the books I did because of her book, um, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, which is about her own childhood, um, which my husband gave me, it, oh, 100 years ago. Um, we were on, Exactly, yeah. When I say that, it's probably about uh, 15, well, when it came, the year it came out, we were on holiday, and uh, he took the children down the beach and gave me the book and said, enjoy it, I think you'll, you'll like it. And I, I read it from cover to cover by the time they came back from the beach. Oh, and I and it was the first time, yeah, the first time I I had read wow. something that resonated. I like her voice. I like uh, I like those kind of um, uh, narratives where that challenge you, but provoke you at the same time. <laughs> they kind of bring you with them, and it's mm -hmm. um, yeah it. it so those would be if I yeah could. no no I get I mean that. I am I am reading a, a, a Colston Whitehead at the moment the Nickel Boys so I am reading books by men but I, I often find and the old the idea that, that that women had to publish under a man's name previously yeah. to to be published at all uh, still really really niggles me <laughs> yeah so, though that that was awful yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does as well. It it niggles all authors. It's not, you know, not just you. It's is a it's a constant um, conversational battle that we have when we're at conventions and you know w when there's a group of us talking or, or even if we're just sitting down for dinner. It's 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 something that that gets brought up quite a lot. Is there an author, past and present, who has influenced, inspired, I, I, or made you I'm excited a, a about reader, books and writing? I spend, I have so little time, um, and then I still have that leftover. It's habitual yeah. behaviour of being told I'm stupid and I Same. couldn't read. So I didn't get the habit, you know. Um, my children, um, some of my children are of readers, course, yeah. some are not. But um, I've always been very envious mm -hmm. of people that say, oh, "I'm just going to sit down and read my book," because I would yeah. be up and down, up and down. I couldn't keep still, but her books are really restless, and that is again mm -hmm. being told that you know I was stupid, so I didn't yep, feel restless, that yeah. I was worthy of reading people's books. Um, so yeah, yeah, I t um, yes, I think Jeanette Winston again. I think she's wonderful. Yeah. I really do. I think that she needs to be up there more and more and more. Mm. She does, she does. She needs to be more recognised than she is. So what genre, if you were to go into a bookstore, if you were um, looking at books online, no, what's the genre that you tend to And this is as a visual person. To? The covers are very, very important to me. Um, you know, really important. Um, I think, I, I'm, not a, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a huge um, memoir and biography reader. Um which is ironic because my first book was my memoir. Um, maybe that put mm -hmm. me off. I don't know. Um, <laughs> is I like human stories. I like political stories. I like gritty <laughs> stories. Um, I like. I'm it. Yeah, I'm there. Well, I'll dip into the fiction aisle as well. So you're but, in that you know, non-fiction aisle. I'm, not very, I'm just not very good on sci-fi and all that kind of stuff. I'm just my head doesn't go there. But I like. To, I like. Yeah challenge i like stories that challenge us and challenge our society yeah yes Absolutely. yeah i always say uh, I accidental re yeah, uh, learning definitely yeah accidental learning through reading has there has it ever been a book that you've picked up and you started to read and you thought, oh, loads. I'll tell you why did I pick one, this though, up? When I was why did I even give teenager, this a chance? And I, I think I wanted to, um, I wanted to impress boys, and I've all, I was always probably more attracted to the rebels, um, you know, uh, and 
the political rebels and the uh, uh, always, intelligent yeah. ones. The I think ones all that, of us you know, were. Oh, if I if I stay with him, you know, just like my social capital, I would be able to get out of this situation. Um, and I remember, I remember buying a copy of Das Kapital by Karl Marx yep. <laughs> and try and sitting in the park outside the polytechnic of the town, the city that I ran <laughs> to after I ran away and pretending to read it. I read a few pages. Yeah, I would sit there. It was like, look at me, I'm intelligent. Look at yeah. me. It was like my boy magnet. Oh, it never okay. worked. And I, I remember reading it, becoming more and more confused. And I would skip through it. And then I remember being slightly disillusioned with the whole idea of, um, uh, of, of yeah. you know, politics and everything. <laughs> oh no, oh, really? I, I get that. Trust me, I I still don't get politics today, and I did modern studies, and I'm just like, eh. So yeah, no, I got kicked out from modern studies for arguing too much. So you, that 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 can tell you. Um, so going into the writing portion of the podcast, how did you go about creating the obstacles? Um, you know, for your story. So it was a way that you kind of got your mind into that frame of, of I've got to write this obstacle for this character and I have to make it something that both the reader resonates with and um, the character resonates with. How did you go about getting that yourself frame into mind, that drawing sort of frame on of mind? Experiences, drawing on um, all the conversations I've had with people where they're describing things that frustrate them. So that might be colleagues from work, that might be friends, it might be my own children. Um, yeah. Just see, or, or, or things that have resonated round and round. Sometimes I think as a writer, things sit in your head or your heart for decades, weeks, days, and they 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 don't. They, and then when they're required, they kind of come out. Yeah, I would agree. So with that, yeah. when so there's a whole load of stuff in in us which comes out when appropriate. Yeah. And I think with with in my books the obstacles. Um, are not insurmountable because I, yeah. I believe in inhuman endeavor and I believe in the, the, the power of being us, the power of being a person. So the obstacles usually um, have to yeah. present huge challenge and shock. And in my books, people look at, I didn't know that happened. And, you know, I didn't know it was like that. I didn't know. Or mm -hmm. they can make your stomach feel a little bit uncomfortable because some of the descriptions about child abuse are quite shocking. And we're not talking just about sexual abuse. So they're uncomfortable. But everything is um, everything yeah, is yeah, workable. Think, yeah. You can, And I think the obstacles, you need to literally step over them with the idea that you, as that person or that the story is stepping over the obstacles, that you can deal with it and that it will be all right. There has to be, it will be all right. We've got to be all right, haven't we? We will be all right. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. What, what would you say inspired you to enter the genre with your own writing voice? What was the, was there a moment that you were like, was, aha, well, this is what I need to do? Or was it kind needed, of just a I gradual to, um, drift into I, it? I needed to help uh, without sounding like, you know, like, you know to pathetic um i needed to to make people aware i think i am a natural activist and a campaigner mm -hmm. no i don't yeah and i think that can be just having a bold conversation in the street with someone and saying no i yeah, didn't think it was a good yeah. idea actually it's about having it's about having the, the confidence to be yourself and to uphold your own beliefs <laughs> and, and it's really, it's a backbone to, to, to I think, the, the, yeah. the, the authenticity yeah, and the clarity important. of our yeah. work. And I think that um, when I uh, I felt that as a society, yeah. I, I speak I speak for others for that don't have the voice yet. So there's an element of campaigning in my work. I'm an ex-teacher. Um, I taught for years. I taught at a university. I taught fashion, actually, and textiles and art. Um, All right. But my yeah. the, in, embedded in me is um, why we learn, what we need like to learn, that, how yeah. we learn, and how can you share learning. So that's part of my writing, and that um, things have to change. So there's yeah. a big change 
uh, within me that I'm a campaigner for change. So we're good, not for bad. So that is the... No, no, I like that. It's 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 admirable because it is a case of I'm doing this for the better. I'm doing this for the for the good of okay. the country and the good of the people that I care about. And you know, I I think that's very very admirable. Would you say that when you're writing all this sort of amazing stories and challenges and stuff, is it that is a movie both. to you, and I know you're not or is like that, that a jigsaw answer, puzzle you that you're kind of trying to put together? To keep the rhythm. You have to have the movie to start from the beginning and get to the end. You have to understand yes, the, the, the process of the characters and, and the, the reality of what you're, you're creating. So for me, it is putting the jigsaw together of process. So for example, there's no point in me talking to my readers about a child experiencing abuse if they don't know how that abuse occurred. So and quite often uh, with the children that I look after or I meet we don't have yeah, that course, form yeah. or life experience with them so you have to be like a detective and you piece it together in a way that um, is supportive of the future narrative so yes it's a bit of both a bit of both but the movie is very in your head is very important and because I'm an artist anyway yeah everything I do is visual so when I write a book my my desk is full of pictures of, of those children of, of rooms of houses of yeah. pet dogs of you know I need them with <laughs> no that ah. made, that makes a lot of sense yeah I I write in a similar fashion actually but it, when uh, I it's kind of kind of good to hear that there's somebody that's a little bit like me well so which character I'm the have you written books, that you would you know, say has stayed me. with you the most? I am the, the character the longest. that works with the children. So I stayed with me all the time. My children yep. and my husband are in the books, but they're getting, we're all getting older. We go younger and we get older. But the, the, So there's a number of us that are always in the books. And my dogs, of course, because never mm -hmm. underestimate the power of therapeutic support for children via an animal or several. Actually, you're, you're, you're talking to someone who believes that um, equestrian therapy for children with disabilities is a necessary part of their care and should be made a, a necessarily part of their care because um, it's a great way of getting them to open up and express themselves and it works really well with traumatized children. Um, I just feel it's a bit sad that but we all don't children should have it. We, 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 we've children. done something really uh, weird to our really children. Really I often should. think, what are we doing to our children? You know, animals are part of our society as well. Why do we in our society, we section off everything, but our, our animals are as much part of us. In yeah. other countries they have, I think it's in Germany, they have things called wolf, wolf schools, wolf schools, where children who... Um, who have yeah. experienced trauma and that perhaps uh, their behaviour is at that point yeah. where they're not conforming and as an ex one of those myself you know, not conforming is your survival and at the start of your identity is that they set up mm -hmm. wolf schools where, where young people go there they've given the puppy and they have to look after that puppy and train that puppy what fantastic skills is that and yeah. I wouldn't and they be train the them. nurturer that I am naturally now, if well, as a child I had, because I did receive a lot of abuse, next door to me was a, a caravan site in an orchard. And within that caravan site, there was a, a retired Irish navvy. If you say yeah. a small child, a small girl was going into a little caravan with an Irish navvy every day, you would be oh. calling children social services. But within... Uh, but something was not right in my convention. You would, home. yeah, you'd be thinking, mm, dad, something's not right he there. So gave yeah, me, no, um, I would be. Yeah. An apron, you know, like with two pockets, like a gingham apron that you get from the supermarket to do your cooking. And uh, I had a chick, and he taught me how to look after and train my chick. And I trained, yeah. and I kept my hand in the apron, and there's just a tiny chick in my hand. And I learned so oh. much from feeling that chick's 
heart on my hand yeah. and, and watching that chick go, it was I, what a gift, what a thing we can do for our for all of us is yeah. to to show us how animals, birds are and to include them in our thinking. So yeah. I think we don't, you know, animals are a big thing in my story because I would love people to think that you know if they're going to look after children with trauma don't forget your animal but my strong advice would be don't get a traumatized animal from a rescue center because you'll increase your workload enormously <laughs> you don't want a traumatized yeah you got a traumatized animal and then a traumatized child yeah no i i did that already i got two traumatized kittens and then yeah they're full time well, I've got one that just, true. you know, any it's change true. to his yeah. routine, oh it's my true. gosh, he, he, he throws a fit. Is there a... Yeah. Yes. Uh, is there, a, my, is the there a character workers, that you Fitzroy wish you Jones. could have written he more was, about? Uh, he, he was uh, uh, the second generation of the Windrush. He was um, ex-army who, um, from Caribbean background, yeah. uh, heritage, who was the best social worker I've ever met in my life and mm -hmm. I would love to develop him more and more. I'm going to bring him back in because he is the voice of right. reason and good sense and he broke rules. He was in the army but when he was in the army you go, wow that's amazing, that's incredible but he, he saw, I think sometimes to be a social worker or to be oh. in those careers you need to have life experience yeah. and to be a foster carer or an adopter you need to have life experience and I get very anxious when yep. they start marketing. You can foster children, you can adopt, and you you don't yeah. you know, as long as you're over eighteen. I'm sorry, but most eighteen year olds need to be getting on with their lives, not dealing with traumatized children. I would I would agree with that actually. And the thing is, when they came to me and said, "Oh, you know, you'd make a really good foster mom." They mm -hmm. knew that I had gone through life experience. I, I actually have PTSD, which I deal with mm -hmm. on a, a regular basis. And I know there's a lot of kids that deal with that. So I think I think they were right in saying, you know, yeah, Crystal, you'd be a really good foster parent. I just, I wouldn't be able to give them back. You know, I would get attached. Uh, that would I, be me. I, I, can... I wouldn't be able to let go. Ah. I, I would be heartbroken if I had to give them back. Um because I, I can't yeah, even do that with the cats. Like I, I couldn't I couldn't adult. foster a cat and give it back. You know, never mind <laughs> a child. So I you know, I also to my husband I said if we adopt it would need to be a closed adoption and just uh you know, just go with it, you know. Um it, it, it's sad, but it's I hard. know that that would be the best for my family and the best for everybody. It's, what so. you, that's it's good thing. to be aware of, of what what what's good for you and what's good for your family so what um what writing techniques have you found helpful um, and, and which well, ones did you try I've and just tried. think <laughs> I've never, what was uh, I my, thinking? My, my mistake is uh, trying to impersonate the way other writers write i you know when you read about people who different authors writing styles and whatever um you can yep. only write as you write now i write the way i paint I collect, I collage, I, I collage stories in my head, phrases, I collage um, on my wall, different things that yeah. I find exciting. Um, I build up, um, if I can show you, I don't know whether you can see, you know, my, my, my wall is full of images where I'm not a spreadsheet person. So I would say that the best way to write is as who you are. If you right. work in chaos, that's creative chaos. If you sit at a desk with a spreadsheet, good for you. That's not for me. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I have to sit. I have to walk I, I can't do the spreadsheet thing either. I have to have it, it all a lot of, bullet uh, pointed out. A lot of visual um, learners, people. Yeah. Um, I'm a visual and a kinesthetic. Yeah. I'm a physically having to do it learner. So you if I don't physically do it, I can't learn it. I don't know are. why that is. But and you yeah. have to be honest about that. So don't, you know, 
I've never been on a writer's workshop, yep. I have to confess. I've never done it because I didn't expect to be a writer. Mm -hmm. But once I started writing, I could not stop. I literally could, I, I write every day before I spoke to yeah. you, I was tapping away. Sometimes I write piles oh, of okay. notes everywhere. You do it your own way. I think, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm terrible for the, the whole getting an idea like three o'clock in the morning and sitting up going, ah, I've got it. And my husband going, whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on? Are you, are you okay? And then me saying, I've got to write something down. And him just doing the whole sort of soccer mom seatbelt thing, sticking his arm out and going, sleep, you know, <laughs> in his Glasgow way. Um, so, yeah, I have actually did it to my mother-in-law yesterday. I was so yep. embarrassed. I was at her That's house it. and I, I got an idea. And I had to sneak yep. my phone. And I was like writing down the idea on my phone on the notes. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> and I'm trying to like get the idea down. Um, and I'm terrible for that. Yep. Uh, you know, especially, you know, with mentorship programs that I get involved in and stuff, I have to kind of be that aggressive yep. way of getting things down You've because they expect the best I mean, writing out of me possible. Uh, so I'm constantly having to come up, cooking come dinner up with new things. Having, so, yeah. You know, dinner. And someone said something, or a penny has just dropped from something earlier yeah. in the day, and I literally get up, run down the the, the hall. We've got quite a long hall, one of the big Victorian yep. tiles, and where we were flooded a while ago, they chink. So you can hear yep. me leg it down the hall into my studio, and I write it down on a note and whack it on the wall, right. run back. What we all need as writers yeah. uh, clothing with pockets that we can keep notebooks in <laughs> to address this issue. Yeah. Oh, we need, we need that would be so helpful because like, the pockets here are like this, you know, they're so small, apron, they're like this size and then you're trying to like, in yeah. And little notebooks and that we can store all our little, our little museum pieces yep. for our books. So all our books. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Clothing for writers. <laughs> that that's a challenge for all the designers out there. Do a writer's line. Oh my gosh, like the men of writers that's out yeah. there now yeah, like could make millions because we would all be out there buying like the cardigans yeah, with the pen slots and the or, what yeah. do we need. Tr not trust quite me, so yeah. Much, but we do need notebooks, notebooks, notebooks. notebooks. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So going into the life portion of the, the podcast, what's the first thing that you do when you want to sort of de-stress from up, editing and writing and painting and, and doing all the stuff that, that you right do in a day? My house, I literally walk out and I go back into my life and I've got children, dogs, people, husband, all carrying on their lives. So I can literally just let go of all those thoughts. I'm really into gardening, so I go out and walk around the garden barefoot, even in the winter. I like to take all my Yeah. I can't do, I can't garden. I, I'm envious <laughs> of the people that have these green thumbs it's, into uh, the nut. I love it, uh, no. I love the colour. I'm, I'm awful. Love I'm terrible with gardening. <laughs> I, I'm a bit yeah. like mad chaos because my house always looks like a bomb's gone Brilliant. off. But it's because I've got all these different projects everywhere. So I quilt and I, I cross stitch it. and I do all this stuff. So my house looks like a whole explosion things going yeah. on. But it's not. It's mad chaos because I, I have so many different projects going on. And then when I know that I'm getting visited by a family member I, or, or somebody, I, I clean it all away. And then... Yeah. I almost forget we where I put everything in there. So like the mad dash after they've gone to try and the find everything. Of yeah. doom. And no, in I, the cupboard I, of doom is where everything we sling everything that was around the house. So the children yes. are like me. This is a, a, a you know pens, paper everywhere. Um, bits of this, bits of Lego, bit half finished, half whatever goes into the cupboard of doom, and then it comes out again. Yeah. But I would be worried if I go into a household, and I have been into households, and I feel creepy. I feel creeped out where nothing is going on, <laughs> where there's no creativity. Well, I mean, honestly, if you came into mine, I, I have 
like because we don't we've just gone uh started going through the cardboard issue where our council doesn't pick up the rubbish bins except for once a month so um yeah so we're, we're sort of learning how to get rid of cardboard and so I've got cardboard boxes and I've got books everywhere <laughs> and I've got bookcases everywhere and, and, you know, I've got a robotic hoover that hoovers the floor for me because I can't hoover. And I've got, you know, a, a, at the moment, looking at my sofa, I've got a quilt that I'm working on slung over the side of the sofa and my handbag's on the, the other sofa because I'm going to be going out after yeah. the podcast. Like, so everything is kind of in place for what I expect to be doing. And then, uh, you know, like, that that's just the way I am. But I get, like, family members that come in and say, you forgot to do your dusting, or why have you not done your dishes, or, you know, but the washing's always done, and there's always food in the fridge, and there's, you know, I, I do the dishes the, every couple of days your, when I remember. Your, uh, okay. But, it, like, the house is a house. It's lived it. Um, They're judgy. Yeah, and, and I, I love the family members that come in and say, oh, you know, if I was a, if I was doing a home check, I'd report you, and I'd be like, I don't think they would, but okay. Yeah, I like think you know, you just have to shrug it off and just kind of keep going with it. So at least I do anyway. Um. So what yeah, hobbies I've do you enjoy, person, and are there ones you wish my, you could explore I, most more? Most of my working life are what other people would call their hobbies. <laughs> so um, I suppose I would just want more time to do more drawing, really, and more painting. That would make me very happy. I earn my living now from writing, and I'm yep. beginning to. And I sold recently yep. paintings. So, am I combining painting, writing, creative? I think hobbies. I don't know. I don't get. Wow. I've never been a hobby person. But again, that's something you either grow up with or you don't. Um, I'm. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree I with that. that I, would, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, I have that kind of situation where I'm like, hmm, <laughs> hobbies. Like, you, know, um, <laughs> you know, I hate that question myself, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a I have a long-term illness, and it's uh, mm -hmm. called idiopathic rheumatoid arthritis. And it really makes me slow down, whether um, I want to or not, and appreciate the day. What would you say makes you slow down and smell the roses? a glass of wine or a coffee. If it's a nice day, I'll sit on my garden bench and just look out and be grateful for the fact that I'm here and that um, and I've got. A, and I'm 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 all right. I came with nothing, and I, now I and feel like got I've got everything place, I yeah. need. I don't want for anything. I'm not. I've never been a materialistic person. I have no desire to own too much. Yeah. What matters to me is that the children are all right. That I hear laughter. The dogs are all right. They wag their tails. The cat brushes around my legs. Yep. Um, and I'm quite happy with that. So I think I feel happy when I'm working. I know that mm -hmm. when I have felt deeply unhappy is um, why, what I'm grateful for not feeling. And those are those times when I wasn't mm -hmm. working and being fulfilling my creative world. I think I actually felt quite depressed because I could never get... I could never get the time to be creative. I yeah. was teaching full time in a creative subject, but yeah, you do. had yeah. children as a carer as well, like most of us end up being. And I think not yeah. being who you are, your yep. authentic self, is the hardest thing. So I'm constantly grateful that um, now in my 50s, I'm doing what I want to do. Yes. It's been, I've had to fight for it, and it hasn't been easy. And I stuck to my guns, so I would say, "Yeah, of that course. would be me sitting down thinking, I've done it. Good. <laughs> I've done it. You have done it, and you know it's an amazing story of what you've done. And I hope people go and check out your story and your Thank mentorship you. story. And I think that that you know it's it's definitely something everybody should read." So where's your favourite place to curl up during the day? Um, do you like going to your I'm, garden? I'm a do you have reader. a cafe or if a reader's snake read, that you like to go to, day, to I like to go to my lovely bed. I'm very fussy about my bed. That's the one Same. area. I like white cotton bedding. And it, and I have to... Uh, this will make you laugh. Every morning, no right. matter 
hot the weather, I open my windows, yes. pull back the bedding, I like my bed aired, plumped up, and when I get back in it, I like my, my nightwear to be cotton. It's all very ritualistic, and I like to sit up mm -hmm. with the correct cushions, glass of water or cup of tea, and I read, yes. and I read. And you know when you go, you, you read until your eyes get so heavy, and then you turn yes. off the that's my favorite reading. Yeah, you read till you fall asleep. Yep. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I agree with you. That's that's my favorite too, and I do that too much. <laughs> so we're now on to the word game, and how the word game works is mm -hmm. I come up with a theme of how I imagine meeting you in a, an ideal world, in a very creative ideal world, and. So I will read off a list of words and you give me like the first book that comes to mind or the first word that comes to mind and that's how it works. So you ready? Oh, well, okay, I'm your first word is autumn. Book with a hedgehog on with autumn leaves on its head and I can't think of what it's called but I remember reading it as a child and it made me feel very warm and cozy. <laughs> yeah. This is genuinely... Oh, that's nice. <laughs> well, we don't need to remember titles as long as we can remember the books. That's, that's the important thing, you know? Um, I, th oh I think that's God. lovely, actually. I love um, that, that answer. That would be... So next one up, we have leather. Ah! Because I imagined meeting you at a polo match in uh, England somewhere where we were drinking fancy teas that's and eating good. cake well, and... Stomping holes, like you know, like for the, the for the players leather, on the field but, um, and discussing books in the and corner and fashion yeah. for a while, leather has other connotations for me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, my mind um, went to it does. Um, yeah, I was I was kind of waiting for you to say that actually. Yeah, uh, I had a friend who was uh, one minute she was you know you get those people that jump through different life personas. One minute. Yeah, she was uh, quite a hardcore Christian, born again, and then she yeah. discovered, yep, she I, was I literally do. catapulted from that particular genre to leather yep. and whips. And... Yeah, she went, she went all that. So that I, when you, I saw the word leather, I just remembered. Oh, a dominatrix. Yeah, she okay. showed me her outfit one day because she was going to a club in London. I can't remember what it was called, but it was one of these clubs where they ring about and stuff. I just remember my jaw hitting the table going, you're worth the sound like yeah. about 150 again. You're wearing that? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, total shock. Yeah, I've been there. Oh I've done that. God, yeah, saddles. No, I, I agree with you on that one. Novels. I love that. <laughs> what about saddles? Yeah. Well, that works. That that that's a novel, so I'll take it. I'll take that one. What about girths? Now, girths for our American friends is the strap that goes right, okay. under the so saddle for me, that and holds quite the saddle a, a onto the horse. Uh, we call it girths over here. Memory, because as uh, children, and this is in my memoir, myself okay. and one of my adoptive siblings, we had that very strap strapping us in at night, so yep. we didn't move. Ah, okay. That's understandable. Yeah. No. That's all right. <laughs> I'll, you know, the, the answers are supposed to be fun, and I, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that one has been a, a bit of a trigger. Bridles. Um, a so our here, next one we? is um, bridles. Bridal ways. Um, back to the polo match, back to... Oh, yep. um, that would be the polo match. Book. Now <laughs> that... Uh, I'm back on Jilly Cooper again, um, because... Yeah, horses, whips, you know. Yeah. No, that that hey, that counts. I'll I'll take that. I like that. Yeah. Um, thinking soap opera. Okay, what um, about soap? Yeah, yeah, soap operas, light-hearted, frothy. That works. Yeah. I'll take that. Soap operas is good. It's a good answer. It's the first one that comes to you, so you know. Boot polish. Catch and your boots. last one, but not I'm least, thinking, is boot uh, polish. Military thinking, 
Um, yeah, there's oh, loads. Okay. Isn't there? Lo- loads I of like that. That's different. Uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s books about various military, some funny, some shocking. Yeah, boot polish. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That 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 is a, a very good response. I will take that. <laughs> well, that's the end of our podcast, everybody. I would like to thank Louise for coming on, and uh, this this podcast is a, an open door podcast. So we really hope that you'll come back when you've got another book coming out, and thank we can you talk so a little much. bit more it's about been it. Absolute pleasure. Um, Great fun. And I, I you know, I hope you've had a good time I've been sitting here with a glass of water, doodling on my notebook, and I and to. Anyone that uh, is listening and you are creative, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Well, come back next week because we have a fantastic new author that will definitely be having you thinking and laughing. So, bye for now.